Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi, I'm Dr. Eileen Chung, and this is part one of the rapid review of EM Cases episode 84 on congenital heart disease emergencies. In this review, we're going to be talking about a practical approach to assessing infants with suspected critical congenital heart disease. Part two of this rapid review will cover investigations and the emergency management of these patients. So you're probably thinking, never mind seeing a sick baby with congenital heart disease in the department. I'm overwhelmed just learning about congenital heart disease. And if you're anything like me, your head probably starts to spin when people start talking about truncus arteriosus or tetralogy of Fallot. Well, don't worry, this is not going to be one of those talks. We're only going to be dealing with the practical aspects of looking out for these patients and then a lean, mean, three-step approach to figuring out what type of cardiac lesion your patient may have. Because you're going to see, you don't actually need to know what the exact lesion is to start resuscitating these patients. So, first let's talk about when you'd worry about congenital heart disease. The reality is, anytime a sick baby comes into the ER, your first thought is likely, this baby's septic, and it should probably still be your first thought. However, You will miss critical congenital heart disease if it's not even on your radar. So what are some clues that should trigger you to even think about it? Well, for one, there's timing. Most children who are going to be presenting with critical congenital heart disease are going to do so in their first six months of life. And then there are the symptoms. Usually they're gradual and not acute onset. And the specific symptoms are likely to be some combination of increased work of breathing poor feeding or poor weight gain, and cyanosis. But as you can see, these are still pretty nonspecific. The take home point here is to cognitively force yourself to think critical congenital heart disease as well as sepsis in any sick infant, especially if they're presenting in their first six months of life. Okay, let's move on to the meat of this rapid review. There's gonna be a theme with the number three throughout the set of videos, so just keep that in mind as we move along. The first set of three we'll encounter is the three-step approach to assessing patients with suspected congenital heart disease. The steps are, number one, age, number two, color, and number three, exam findings and bedside tests. As we've talked about already, you don't have to know what the exact lesion is to take care of these patients. So the two important questions you're actually trying to answer with this three-step approach are, is the lesion ductal dependent or not? since this has implications for whether you're going to start prostaglandins. And then, is this a shunting, also known as a mixing lesion, a right obstructive lesion, or a left obstructive lesion? This will have implications for fluid resuscitation and oxygen supplementation, but we'll get to all that in part two when we talk about management. So, step one, age. The important number to remember here is one month. Is this baby less than a month old? If the answer is yes, this baby is most likely presenting with a ductal dependent lesion. If the baby is 1 to 6 months old, it's much more likely that he or she is presenting with a shunting or mixing lesion. So that first important question of ductal dependence or not, the age of your baby answers that. Steps 2 and 3 will help you answer that second important question of what type of cardiac lesion you're dealing with. Step 2. Color. Is the baby pink, blue, or gray? If the baby looks pink, then you know there's adequate pulmonary blood flow. In fact, if the baby looks pink but is working hard to breathe, then there's probably too much pulmonary blood flow, or in other words, congestive heart failure. That or it's not a cardiac issue at all, but a primarily respiratory disorder. So your main differential here would be bronchiolitis, since you're likely to hear crackles to the lung fields. If the baby looks blue, this means there's either inadequate pulmonary blood flow from a right-sided obstructive lesion, or it means the baby's not oxygenating well because of a mixing lesion. Let's just clarify here that when we say blue baby, we mean the baby has central, not peripheral cyanosis. The differential for a blue baby includes congenital heart disease, sepsis, respiratory disorders, and hematological disorders. The exam findings that we'll talk about in step three will help you narrow the differential. If the baby looks gray, this is bad news. This implies inadequate perfusion of the systemic circulation. In this case, think of a left-sided obstructive lesion. The number one differential here besides congenital heart disease is sepsis. 
What will steer you towards congenital heart disease will be the presence of abnormal cardiovascular exam findings we'll talk about in step three. So to summarize, in the context of heart disease in infants, pink baby means heart failure, blue baby means right obstructive or shunting lesion, and gray baby means left obstructive lesion. Let's recap. Step one was age, step two was color, now we arrive at the much anticipated step three, key exam findings and bedside tests. These nuggets of information will help you tease out the diagnosis of critical congenital heart disease from all those other diagnoses we have to consider. Remember the theme of threes? Well, let's group these exam pearls and tests into three categories so they're easier to remember. Number one is the respiratory exam, in quotations. Number two is the cardiovascular exam. And number three is the abdominal exam. Let's first talk about the respiratory exam. Unsurprisingly, there are three things to look for. These pearls are grouped under respiratory because they deal with oxygenation and ventilation. The first exam pearl in this group is about ventilation. Watch the baby breathe. Is the baby simply breathing fast, which we'll call quiet tachypnea, or is the baby struggling to breathe and showing signs like tracheal tugging and intercostal indrawing? This matters because quiet tachypnea more likely has to do with congenital heart disease or with acidosis, whereas babies with struggling tachypnea are more likely to have a primarily respiratory disorder. Let's pause a second before we talk about the oxygenation part of the exam in order to clarify the terms preductal and postductal. Your preductal sat or blood pressure is always going to come from the right upper extremity, while the postductal sat or blood pressure is coming from either of the lower extremities. Now that we're on the same page about preductal and postductal, let's talk about the two bedside tests you can do for suspected congenital heart disease that concern oxygenation. The first is to compare the baby's preductal and postductal peripheral oxygen saturation. You'd be highly suspicious that your patient has critical congenital heart disease if they have any one of the three following abnormal findings. So, number one, the difference between the preductal and postductal sats is greater than 3% or the oxygen saturation is less than 94% in both preductal and postductal limbs, or the oxygen saturation is less than 90% in any limb. The second test for oxygenation is the hyperoxia test. If there's no improvement in the SAT after applying 100% oxygen for several minutes, suspect congenital heart disease. So let's review the three tests in the respiratory exam. The first is to look for quiet versus struggling tachypnea. The second is to look for abnormal peripheral oxygen saturation using both preductal and postductal sats. And the third is the hyperoxia test. Moving on to the cardiovascular exam, you guessed it, there are three pearls. These abnormal exam findings are significant because they all point you toward a left-sided obstructive lesion. They are, number one, absent or decreased femoral pulses, number two, a femoral brachial or femoral radial pulse delay, and number three, a blood pressure differential between the preductal and postductal limbs. And finally, we reach the third category in our exam pearls. We'll give you a bit of a break here. Instead of three, there's only one abnormal finding for the abdominal exam that's important, and that's to examine for hepatomegaly. So there you have it, part one of the rapid review to congenital heart disease emergencies. The two main learning points from this video are, to cognitively force yourself to consider critical congenital heart disease just as you would consider sepsis in any sick baby less than six months of age, and to use the three-step approach that includes age, color, and key exam findings and bedside tests to help you figure out if your patient's likely to be presenting with critical congenital heart disease, and if so, what type of lesion it might be.